Good evening and welcome. I'm Martin Ludden. It's my honor to serve as the executive director of SPNN. Our mission is to empower people to use media and technology to make better lives, use authentic voice, and build common understanding. Tonight we're working in uh, a continuation of a long and fruitful partnership with the leagues of women voters of both Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we have Secretary of State Steve Simon here to build some common understanding. Uh, that's the part of our mission we're working on tonight about new processes for Minnesota's presidential primary voting. It's really easy to be cynical about a lot of things right now, um, especially politics, which is why it is so refreshing to work with the league. This is important stuff. Uh, voting is important, participation is important, and this work is very important. I like to think we're pretty good at what we do here at SPNN, but I also want to call out our peer organizations across the metro that are bringing this programming live tonight or via replay to their communities. We'd like to thank MTN in Minneapolis, Town Square TV in Inver Grove, uh, Bloomington Educational TV, Southwest Community TV in Edina, CTV in Roseville, ETV in Egan, Quad Cities Community TV in Champlin, and SCC TV in White Bear Lake. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being here. And thanks for voting. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Anita Newhouse and Amy Mino. Come on up. Welcome to this session on the presidential primary. We're so glad you could be here tonight. And we'd like to say thank you for joining us to those here tonight in the studio, as well as those who are watching the broadcast. Uh, we would especially like to thank the many community media stations throughout the Metro who are carrying this important program. The League of Women Voters is a political, nonpartisan organization that works to provide access to all voters. Um, we are about voting. We want to make sure that people are informed and educated and can um, have access to the most one of the most important instruments of our democracy. Uh, the program tonight will be a presentation of approximately 30 minutes, followed by a question and answer session. You have access to cards and pencils on your chairs. Please use them and get your questions to the volunteers who will gather them. And then also, please, please uh, take a minute to fill out your evaluation at the end of the program and you can give that to a volunteer at the door on your way out. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. I'm pleased to welcome you for the League of Women Voters St. Paul, and I want to give some thanks to the people who helped bring this program together tonight. Um, a special thanks to Martin Ludden and the SPNN staff. They've been wonderful. And a special thanks to Steve Brinsberg, the operations and productions manager, who has been our lead on this program. Uh, we'd like to thank the Minnesota Secretary of State's office, uh, Steve Simon, and the voter outreach specialist, Michael Wall, as well, for helping us organize. And then I also want to give a big thank you to Claudia Dieter of the St. Paul League and her program committee, and those volunteers who helped put together all the refreshments and things for tonight's program. So uh, just a, a brief bio on uh, Secretary of State Steve, Steve Simon. As Secretary, as Secretary of State since 2015, Steve Simon partners with township, city, and county officials to organize elections on behalf of Minnesota's nearly 4 million eligible voters and to ensure that the election system is fair. His goals are to expand access to voting, remove barriers to voting, make business services as streamlined as possible, strengthen protections for victims of domestic violence, and to serve as Secretary of State for all Minnesotans. Before being elected to the Secretary of State's position, Steve Simon ser served in the Minnesota House of Representatives, representing the communities of St. Louis Park and Hopkins. He also served as Assistant Attorney General of Minnesota and worked as a lawyer in private practice. He has received numerous recognitions for his awards uh, for his work on behalf of Minnesotans and includes the Civic Leadership Award from the Civic League. Citizens, I'm sorry, the Citizens League. Please join me in welcoming Secretary of State Steve Simon. Well, hi, everyone. 
everyone. Thanks for having me. Can you hear me? Is this on? Okay. I want to thank you for having me. If it's okay with you, I'm not going to stand behind a podium for all this time. I think it's good to mix it up a little bit. And, um, and I want to leave as much time as possible for Q&A, not just Q, but A, and not my A's, your A's. In other words, I'm interested in your questions, but I'm also interested in your answers, your comments, your pushback, your feedback, your suggestions. So I want to leave enough time for all of that as well. So I'm Steve Simon, Minnesota Secretary of State. It's an honor to serve you in that role. This is my second term. I was elected to this office first in 2014 and then re-elected in 2018. You heard I was in the legislature before that. I still li live in the area that I represented. It's in fact the area where I grew up. I live in Hopkins, Minnesota, um, just to the west of Minneapolis. Grew up there, went to Hopkins High School. I still live there with my wife and we like to say we have two of each. Two dogs, two cats, and two kids. So that's our two of each. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today. I know that we are competing for audience and interest with the impeachment trial. So I will do my level best to make sure that all of you who are in attendance and who are watching are getting your money's worth and the entertainment that you, that you bargained for. Um, I also heard that at the end there are going to be evaluations or reviews. I did not realize this was graded. So, you know, I'm just a little bit nervous about that. So be kind. Um, so... I want to say a little bit before we talk about the presidential nominating primary directly, I want to put it in a little bit of uh, perspective and provide a little bit of context about that event that we're now in the middle of. Last Friday was the first day of absentee voting for the presidential nominating primary, and it's a somewhat unique experience for us in Minnesota in modern times, but I want to put it in a little bit of context. First, a little bit about my role or the role of my office. So we at the Office of Secretary of State wear many hats. We do many things, we have several duties. Uh, but it's probably no surprise that if you were to go out on any street and corral 10 people at random and ask them, what does the Office of Secretary of State of Minnesota even do? You've maybe heard of the office, what does it even do? I would say, I would bet my next paycheck that um, if they knew, the number one answer by far would be elections. We do other things, other things that we're very proud of. But that is the function that gets the most attention, uh, typically the most interest around election time, the most scrutiny, and so forth. And so it's no surprise that I'm before you in an election year in 2020 talking about those issues, those elections issues. Now because we're so involved in elections, because we serve as the chief elections administrator for the state of Minnesota, I like to say that I am in the democracy business. And what a time to be. <laughs> in the democracy business, am I right? Um, <clears throat> we live in interesting times, so the saying goes, but especially now and especially when it comes to democracy and politics and public affairs. No question about that. Um, it's an intense time. I don't expect that to go away anytime soon, especially in this presidential election year, so buckle up for an, a particularly intense year of our lives and our, and our sort of um, a national state of being, I guess. Um, but, um, but that's okay. Minnesota, despite all of that, despite sometimes what might seem like noise and why, what might to some people seem like a distraction and what might be off-putting or upsetting to some people about politics and government and campaigns and democracy itself, despite all of that, many of you know that Minnesota has fared very, very well. We've done well. Um, I, I'll tell you this. Um, it's no surprise that the 2016 election was a very, very intense time, very intense. Many of you have lived through a fair number of presidential elections. I have too. But I think for any of us, we may live to be 100, and we may all look back and say it was never as intense as 2016. That may have been the crest, the peak, the zenith, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think the reason is pretty simple. And let me say this as diplomatically as I can. I think it's fair to say that in 2016, we had two major party presidential nominees who inspired strong feelings. How's that? Is that diplomatic enough? Inspired strong feelings. That's maybe a nice way of saying people felt very, very strongly about these two people. Very strongly. Strong feelings of like and equally as strong feelings of dislike. How many people do you know in October of 2016, let's say Halloween 2016, 
who, I'm talking about friends, families, coworkers, whoever, neighbors, how many people do you know who sort of shrugged their shoulders and said, you know, I need more information. I don't really have a strong opinion on either of these people, right? On either of them. Maybe they'd say that maybe about one of them, but how many people could say that about both of them? Probably this many, zero, if you're like me, okay? And I think that mirrors the experience of most Americans and most Minnesotans. But despite all of that, you know, there are one, or, one of two ways, basically speaking, to react to that kind of intensity, that kind of daily assault of information and feelings and emotions and um, uh, sort of depth of feeling. One is to lean away from it, to want to sort of go ahead, put your, head, put your head under the covers and say, you know, wake me when it's over. The other way, the Minnesota way in 2016, was to lean into it despite how awkward it was, despite how intense it was to lean into it. And that's been the Minnesota experience. So um, you may know that uh, Minnesota has a really great record when it comes to voter participation and engagement. And part of that is due to you. Part of that is due to the legacy and the work of longstanding by groups like the League of Women Voters. And so I want to thank you so much for all you have done over the years, really over the decades, to nurture that in Minnesota in particular. I can't speak to other states with any expertise, but in Minnesota, you have nurtured that, you have guided that, and for that, I say thank you. Thank you very much for all the work that you've done. Uh, you may know that uh, at one point during our recent history in Minnesota, for nine elections in a row, nine in a row, we were number one in the country in voting. Just think about that. Let that sink in for a minute. If you heard about a win streak like that in any other area, if you heard about nine, uh, an athlete who won nine MVP awards in a row, or an actor or actress who won nine Oscars in a row, you'd be totally floored. But Minnesota, once upon a time, nine in a row, until a few years ago. A few years ago, Minnesota fell off just a little bit, not a lot. The year that I was elected to this office in 2014, we were number six in the country. Not bad. Not bad at all, nothing to be ashamed of. Hey, if you're grading on a curve, six out of 50, that's pretty good. You'd take that grade home to mom and dad, right? Six out of 50 is very, very decent. But I had a feeling we could do better. So when I came in in January of 2015, the challenge that I issued was, hey, let's try to get back to number one. We've been there. In fact, once upon a time, we were there nine times in a row. We know what that feels like. We know what that looks like. We'll have to do things a little differently. We'll have to break the mold a little bit, try some new strategies shoot for some different kinds of outcomes, reach out to new people. So we retooled and did a lot of things differently. I'll spare you all the details except to say that when the dust settled in 2016, that very tumultuous, very, very intense time in election, when many people could have been forgiven for leaning away, we leaned in. And here's the spoiler alert. In 2016, we got to our goal, back on top, number one in the United States of America for voting in Minnesota, which is great. Um, yeah, well, sure. We're very proud of that. But you know from your daily lives, whether it's work or sports or business or a hobby or anything else, the only thing tougher than getting to number one is staying, staying number one, right? It's, it's just, it, it, that's the truth. So going into 2018, we felt that we had a record to uphold, and so we doubled down. We tried even uh, more new and different and unique sort of strategies. And of course, we're one organization. It isn't just our office, of course. But thanks to people like Michael Wall, who's here uh, in our office and is uh, sort of the uh, mastermind of several of those strategies, um, 16. And I'll save you again all the details except to say in 2018, for the second time in a row, Minnesota got back to the top of that mountain, number one in the country two times in a row in voter turnout. And you want to hear what the kicker is? Not only number one in the country in voter turnout, but in 2018, we were number one in the country for youth voter turnout as well, okay? That's something to be proud of. I know I am, and I know Michael is because he works on that area in particular, so he, uh, we owe a lot of that to, to him in particular. Uh, so now going into 2020, the pressure is absolutely unbearable, right? Two in a row, number one. We've got a record to uphold, a reputation to uphold. We want the hat trick. We want the three-peat. Whatever you want to call it, we're going for three in a row as number one in the country. And let's not, for, not, let's not lose sight of the real goal, which is not so much being number one. It's beating Wisconsin, <laughs> right? Because let's face it, if we were like number 47 and they were number 48, we'd secretly be a little happy and proud, right? 
Um, but I think there is every opportunity for Minnesota in this um, presidential election year to do very well, and quite possibly number one, at least that's our goal. And I get asked a lot, and I wanna say this and set the stage and set the table before I talk specifically about the presidential nominating primary, I get asked a lot, why Minnesota? What is it about us that has us performing so well so frequently? What is it? Is it something in the water? Is it dumb luck? Is it sheer coincidence? No, nope, I don't think it's any of those things, not surprisingly. I think it's a couple of other things I wanted to share with you today, and I think it's consistent with the main topic tonight. First is laws. We've got good laws on the books. Thank you again, League of Women Voters, because you have been there for years and decades, not only getting good stuff passed, but getting bad stuff killed at the legislature, okay? That's extraordinarily important, and you've done it. You have the record, and you have the scars to show it. I was there in the legislature. I've seen that work be done by you and a coalition of folks around Minnesota. So we have good laws. What do I mean? Well, many of you are acquainted with them, but they bear repeating. First, we have um, same day or election day voter registration. That is the jewel in the crown. We've had it since 1974, and that, in my opinion, more than anything else, accounts for our consistent performance and excellence when it comes to turnout. You know, we're still one of only, I think, 16 states in the country now that has it. After all these years and decades, that's it. In most of the rest of the country, and some of you know firsthand because you've lived in those other states, in most of the rest of the country, if you aren't registered by a cutoff date that's a month or five weeks before the November general election, you're out. That is it. There is no recourse. There is no, hey, I forgot, or I misunderstood the law, or I didn't realize, or I was sick. That's it. You're done. You are done. You're not done in Minnesota. In Minnesota, you can get up on election day either unregistered or needing to re-register, go to your polling place and register and vote in one fell swoop right then and there on game day. And like I say, that more than anything has moved the ball. We have online voter registration, which is fantastic. We have no excuses absentee voting, which is a clunky title, but it really means vote from home. You know, before 2013, if you wanted to vote on any day other than election day, the day before, the week before, the month before, it didn't matter. If you wanted to do any of that, you had to sign an oath under penalty of perjury, stating and swearing that you were either gonna be out of town that day or you were too sick or disabled to show up in person at the polling place. Um, and we changed that law in 2013. It was my bill. It was my last term in the legislature. And we changed that. And now any one of us can vote absentee for any reason or no reason. The question isn't even asked. You can just do it because you want to do it. That's it. And so I don't want to bury you with statistics, but this one I like. Um, before we passed that law in 2013, the typical or average percentage of people who voted absentee in a given general election was about 8%. You know what it was a little over a year ago in 2018? 24%. In a few years, we've tripled it. That means almost a quarter of Minnesotans are voting before election day has even rolled around. That has real consequences downstream for politics, for campaigns, for how the public thinks about elections. I'll tell you about, I'll tell you about how I think of elections now, and increasingly we all will. Election day is really no longer the day we vote. It's the last day that we vote. A day that begins for, a, a process that begins 46 days earlier with the start of an absentee period and then ends on election day. But election day isn't the day that we vote, it's the last day, and probably for the foreseeable future, the biggest day, for sure, in terms of traffic and participation. So laws is one reason, good laws on the books. Second reason, I think, is culture. You own a piece of that, you who are involved in the League of Women Voters. You own a piece of that. In Minnesota, we have a strong voting culture. Hard to put your finger on, hard to articulate all the time in every way, but I think culture for this purpose is a habit or a way of doing things. A habit or a way of doing things. In Minnesota, our habit, our way of doing things is to vote, is to prize election contests as real, as significant, as consequential, as a validation of the fact that people get elected to offices of all kinds up and down the ballot, and what they do or fail to do once they get into those offices has real downstream effects on all of us in every day in every way. And we get that in Minnesota. And let me just zoom out for a minute and give you a historical example of what I'm talking about in terms of um, Minnesota and our voting culture. Um, in my first year in this office, we put on a statewide celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
Now, if we were to take a vote in this building or among the viewing audience right now on the Voting Rights Act, I bet it would be 100% to zero, okay? It's a no-brainer. Of course we're gonna end poll taxes and literacy tests for voting and so-called character tests for voting. Um, of course we're gonna do that. There's no controversy there, but in 1965, of course, it was very controversial. And in 1965, Minnesota's U.S. House delegation was eight people, just as it is now, split exactly down the middle. Four Democrats, four Republicans. And those eight people were at each other's throats on a lot of issues of the day. The escalating conflict in Vietnam, the newly proposed Medicare and Medicaid programs, fair housing, immigration, uh, federal spending, and so on. And yet, in the summer of 1965, when the roll was called on the Voting Rights Act in Congress, Minnesota spoke with one voice. We were one of the relatively few unanimous states across party lines. All eight of our members, all the Democrats, all the Republicans, rural, suburban, urban, liberal, conservative, all voted for the Voting Rights Act. That says something about us. Here's what it doesn't say. I'm not drawing the lesson or the moral of the story that, oh, Democrats and Republicans are always arm in arm on elections issues. No, of course not. They aren't. What I am saying is that on the big stuff, on the big moral questions around voting and democracy, who's in and who's out? Who gets to participate and who is shut out? We have tended to agree more than we disagree. And I think we can get even closer to that ideal in the coming years. I'm an optimist. So that's what I mean by culture. We do it really well in our office, as Michael can attest. Uh, we tried to harness new cultural understandings about what it would take to get and stay at number one, or at least to perform really, really well. So for example, one area that Michael's been really involved in uh, has to do with uh, our youngest voters. And as you heard, in 2018, we were number one in the country among voters 18 to 29. And so we started thinking about different strategies when it came to our younger, youngest voters. We uh, started uh, in high schools. And we thought this is about getting good habits started early. So we started the first ever mock election for high school students across the state of Minnesota. When we first tried this in 2016, we thought, all right, let's shoot for 100 high schools. It's a nice round number. It's triple digits. It's memorable. That's our goal. Well, we didn't reach 100. We reached almost 300 high schools that year for a total of 96,000 ballots. And then we went on uh, in 2018, and we had about 130,000 ballots. Uh, we had a new program in colleges and universities across Minnesota to uh, have them compete against one another to uh, register students to vote. That, too, was a big success. And we even even went so far as to tinker and toy with the language that we used around youth voting. We actually read some language that said, and some studies of the, at the time in 2015 and early 2016 that said that if you talk to young people in particular, but people of all ages about voting, it's important that you talk about it not just as something uh, to do, but something to be. So it's not just about doing something, go vote, you should vote, please vote, it has a little bit of an eat your vegetables quality to it. Um, but if instead you say stand up, step up, be a voter, be something, not just do something. And I remember as we were formulating these plans, I was talking to a friend of mine about this and sharing with him what we had learned, and all of a sudden he stopped me. Big grin on his face, and he said, wait a minute, this, this is a great insight. You're saying, young people, you talk about be something, not do something. This is great. I have a teenage daughter at home. From now on, I'm going to tell her, be a laundry folder. <laughs> no word on whether that worked for him. But um, the point is, those are some of the cultural things that we've worked on in our office. So I, I, I use that as sort of a backdrop. We're used to election excellence in this state, trying new things. Not all of them are successful. Many are. I'd say most are. Uh, but the combination of good laws... Uh, a good culture full of groups like the League of Women Voters and others who want to maximize participation, who want to strengthen democracy, year in and year out, whether it's an intense year or not, whether it's a presidential contest or a municipal contest or anything else, that's sort of the secret sauce in Minnesota. And so here we are in this presidential election year, and we're in the middle of a process, the presidential nominating primary, which is new for us in Minnesota, and we'll see afterwards whether it was a noble and successful experiment or whether it was something else. So last Friday, Friday, January 17th, was the first day of absentee voting for this 
relatively new, as I'll explain, presidential nominating primary, or if you really want to be fancy and in the know, PNP is what we call it. That's our lingo. Presidential nominating primary, so as to distinguish it from the other kind of primary, which is the one that we have in our state in August, which is a totally different creature, yet it has that primary name uh, in it. And that's the process, of course, as you all know, by which multiple candidates in a political party typically are winnowed to one. So if there are five candidates who are Democrats running for governor, at the end, when the dust settles from that primary, there's one who's the nominee. Um, that's a different creature, as I say, than what we're going through right now, the presidential nominating primary. So let me zoom out a little bit and discuss, at least in my opinion, how and why we're here. Why are we doing this thing? So let's go back again to 2016, that hyper intense presidential election year and contest. So in 2016, we had an open seat presidential election, meaning there was no incumbent. President Barack Obama was term limited. We knew, all of us as Americans, that no matter what, we would be electing the next president of the United States. There would be a new president who would take the oath of office on January 20th, 2017. So the stakes were high and the interest was high on both sides of the aisle. An open seat race, an open contest in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, and it showed. And um, to sum up, I would say that the caucus process, which was typically, and for the last several decades, what Minnesotans have used uh, in the political parties to choose and allocate delegates to the national conventions that determine the party nominees, that caucus process was a victim of its own success. So many people turned out on both the Republican and the Democratic sides in 2016 that it literally overwhelmed the ability of party volunteers to handle the crush of people. Junior high school classrooms or church basements or community centers, rooms that were meant for 30 or 40 people asked to house 130 or 140 people. People who turned away from the parking lot in disgust, unable to find a spot on a snowy Minnesota night like tonight. Uh, people who got into the hallways and found themselves crushed and crammed against the walls. People who took one look at the room they were supposed to fill along with 100 others and said, to heck with it, I'm getting out of here. Uh, uh, ballots that ran out and people having to write their straw poll choices on post-it notes and whatever they could find. The legislature took note of that. And um, I'll try to channel the legislature here and what they were thinking since I once was a legislator, but I was in this job by then. And the legislature said, look, the caucuses are valuable, and we're gonna keep the caucuses. We're gonna be a hybrid state. We're not gonna go all in on one or the other. We're gonna keep the caucuses, and indeed in Minnesota here on February 25th, we're gonna have precinct caucuses like we always do. So if you're a committed Democrat or a committed Republican or anything else, you can still go to caucuses. But the legislature said, we're gonna take this one contest for this one office, President of the United States, recurring obviously only every four years. We're gonna take it out of the caucus process. We're gonna put it and run it separately on a parallel track with the caucuses as a real election. Not pieces of scratch paper in an overcrowded junior high classroom, a real election with real polling places, your polling place that you're used to, with real election judges, state and in some cases federal law that applies, real ballots, real election equipment, the whole thing, a real election. And so this year is the first time really since 1956 that we've done exactly this. There was a one-off experiment in 1992. Some of you may remember that. I do. Uh, but in 1992, it was a little apples and oranges. It wasn't a binding primary. Some of the rules were quite different from what it is today. You really have to go back 64 years to 1956, the last time Minnesota did exactly what we're in the middle of doing right now, which is choosing or allocating, I should say, um, delegates to the various national conventions on the basis of a statewide primary contest. So when the legislature was drafting this, uh, the national parties took note. The Republican National Committee, or RNC, and the Democratic National Committee, the DNC. And they said to the Minnesota legislature, okay, wait a minute here, wait a minute. If you're gonna move to a primary, that's fine, but our party rules dictate, they both said this, arm in arm, at the testifier's table in the legislature. They don't agree on much, but they agreed on this strongly. They sat next to each other, the party chairs, and they said, our national party rules, both political parties, national party rules, they said, dictate that this must be a closed primary. Not everyone can vote in it. We only want the Democrats voting in the Democratic primary, the Republicans voting in the Republican party, and here's where I'm gonna get a little wonky on you, okay? Minnesota, as you know, I hope, we're not a party registration state. Never have been. Never since statehood. Most of the states in this country 
over 30 of the states, so we're in the minority, over 30 of the states, you do register by political party. So when you register to vote, you're asked to say what your preference is. Are you a registered Democrat or a registered Republican or a registered independent or uncommitted or libertarian or whatever? We don't have that and we've never had that in Minnesota. So how do you make something a closed primary when you don't have party registration? If it's a party registration state, it's pretty easy. If you're a registered Republican, you can vote in the Republican primary. We don't have that. You're just plain registered here. You're not registered as anything. So the way to do that, they said, is we're gonna have separate ballots, so said the national parties. We need you to have separate ballots. Uh, and they said, um, the, we need the parties to have a record of who voted in which, uh, who, to, who chose which ballot, in other words. The Democrats need to know who the Democrats are and the Republicans need to know who the Republicans are, okay? So they insisted on that as a condition. Otherwise, they said, or threatened, we will decline to recognize this primary that you're in the process of doing, and both parties will get zero delegates to their national conventions. So you'll go all through this time and expense, and you will get nothing. You will get nothing. The, the Minnesota sign at the convention, you know, those big kind of vertical signs, there will be an empty chair. Okay, that's what they said. So the legislature was in a tough spot, and they agreed to this. So they created a system by which there will be, and there are right now, separate ballots. And the voter in Minnesota, uh, who either by absentee now or on game day, which is March 3rd, which is also Super Tuesday, a number of other big states, California, Texas, and others, will be holding their primary contest on that day too. A voter in the polling place or beforehand will have to choose and will have to say and designate, please give me either the DFL party presidential ballot or the Republican presidential ballot. Now, in 2016, when the legislature wrote this law, um, it did something that I think was unfortunate um, which is they said that the information about who chose which party's ballot would be public information, public, totally public, not just journalists, but your nosy neighbor, your coworker, your boss could find out, hey, I wonder who all the Democrats working for me are, or I wonder who all the Republicans working for me are. I can just find that information out. Fortunately, and to their credit, legislators responded. Last session, I and others pushed for them to um, close that loophole to tighten that and make sure that it was no longer public data. The good news is they did that. It's no longer public. Journalists, your nosy neighbor, your boss can't get it. The bad news, in my judgment, is that at the end of last legislative session, the uneasy compromise that was reached, by the way, not with me or my office in the room. I hope and expect the outcome might have been different had we been in the room. We weren't in the room. At the end of session, and I can explain later my um, conjecture about how this happened, but at the end of the session, the uneasy um, compromise that was reached was, okay, it won't be public. But all four political parties, major political parties in Minnesota, we have four now, the DFL party, the Republican party, and two parties dedicated to the legalization of marijuana, two different ones, so four major parties. All four major parties will get all of the lists. All four will get all, okay? so. A voter in Minnesota who votes in the PNP, in the presidential nominating primary, will, again, have to choose, either on game day or beforehand, which ballot they want, and the information showing which party's ballot they chose, not who they voted for, secret ballot is sacred, no one will know who, but they'll know which party's ballot you chose. Um, the way the legislature wrote it is that four different political parties will have that information. Now, how many of you in this room, I know the viewing public might not be able to see this, but I'll try to convey it. How many people in this room have ever attended a party caucus? Ever, doesn't matter what party. Okay, almost everyone in the room, 80 to 90%. So in my opinion, and I have two, in my opinion, caucus attendees reasonably expect that when they go in, there's always a sign-in sheet. You give your name and your address and your phone number and that kind of thing, email. They reasonably expect that when they do that, that they're, the leadership of their party is gonna get that information. Not a shocker, okay? I think it would be unreasonable to expect otherwise. But I think people would um, be surprised if in that situation they went to a caucus and not only would their party get that information, but three other parties, not their own, would also get that information, okay? That's gonna be unsettling to a lot of Minnesotans. And it won't just be unsettling based on uh, that principle. It'll be unsettling for a number of people, in my view, um, for other reasons, say, professional reasons. You can well imagine 
people in certain occupations who don't care to have the information about their party leaning disseminated in that way. It's not public, that's true, but it's in the hands of four political parties. And by the way, there are no guidelines, no guardrails, no restrictions whatsoever in state law about what those parties can do with that data once they get it, none. So for example, and this is an extreme hypothetical, I'm not saying anyone's planning to do this, but let's say one of the political parties wanted to just post it online. We've asked ourselves the question, what legal impediment is there to them doing that? And the answer we've come up with is none. So if one of the parties wanted to get the data of hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans and who chose which ballot, kind of a proxy for their political affiliation, they could just post it online. Hey, Minnesota, go to this website, and if you want to see a per your neighbor or your employee or anyone else and what their part of party affiliation is, you can see it right here. Um, and to me, that really looks like a backdoor party registration system. I would say it's even harsher than a backdoor party registration system because in any, every state that I'm aware of that registers by party, which is the majority, there is always an option to register as unaffiliated or independent. There will be no such option this time. You have to pick a team, pick a jersey, and that's it. There is no saying, well, I want to vote in the DFL presidential primary, but I'm an independent or I'm unaffiliated. No. When you sign in, you'll be signing an oath, an oath, saying that you generally agree with the principles of the party whose ballot you have chosen today. Um, and because we don't have party registration and never have, that is also a political culture question for us in Minnesota. You know, I don't doubt that in states like Iowa or New York or California or others, that where they're used to signing on the dotted line and disclosing publicly, by the way, what their party affiliation is, maybe that isn't much, as much of a concern. But I know Minnesota, and you know Minnesota, and I think people here are quite uneasy about that. Uh, most people don't want to wear it on their sleeve. Now, many of you in this, in this room maybe do wear it on your sleeve. You're the kind who have bumper stickers on your car every election and lawn signs in your yard, and you sport lapel pins for your favorite candidate, and that's fine, but not everyone's like that. And as I was starting to say earlier, um, we can well imagine people in certain occupations, certain professions, who just by virtue of what they do for, for work, for a living, are going to be really uneasy about participating. Imagine a journalist a member of the clergy, a school administrator, a city clerk, and on and on and on. You can well imagine people in those professions who will be really wary of rolling the dice in terms of uh, that information being out there among four political organizations with no legal restrictions whatsoever on what they can do with the information. So that is a worry. Uh, it certainly is a worry for me. It's a worry for a lot of folks. And uh, my, my, um, my fear is that it's going to chill participation. And so my office uh, has drafted and will have ready for release on the first day of the legislative session legislation that will put some restrictions on what the parties can do. Now, make no mistake, my first choice, if I were emperor for a day, could wave a magic wand, my first choice would be to make this contest like our August primary. Those of you who voted in that primary, different kind of creature, like I said, but in the August primary, it's all on one page. You can't cross the line. You can't vote for one office in one party and one in the other, but it's all on one page and totally untraceable. No one could or would ever be able to trace your party affiliation or which side of the line you voted on ever. It's just physically impossible. They couldn't do it. That's my first choice, okay? But the national parties claim that that's a non-starter. My second choice would be to make sure that only the Democrats know who the Democrats are, only the Republicans know who the Republicans are, and so forth. Four organizations don't get all the names and all the lists. That would be my second choice, but I think that is probably politically untenable given the political lineup at the Capitol and the people who were behind this end of session deal in the, in the first place. So my third choice is what we're doing. My third choice is to say, look, if you're going to give four parties the lists, let's at least put in some common sense rules, some guardrails um, to govern the, the, the conduct with respect to this very personal and sensitive information in the case of many Minnesotans. So we're going to have legislation, details to follow, that will do that. It will be as restrictive as we can possibly make it. Basically limit it only for the particular use that the National Party rules say they must have, which is to verify that 
Democrats voted in the Democratic primary or Republicans voted in the Republican primary. You can't use it to ask people for money. You can't use it to, you know, prospect for votes. It's only that very narrow definition. Um, and details will follow. We're still working with authors, and we're still sort of wordsmithing the language. But we're going to have that legislation in place, and I think it's very important. And there's time. Uh, one question that I get is, well, wait a minute. We're already into January here. We're in the middle of the absentee period. Can anything be done in time for this contest? And the answer is yes. The legislature gets back on February 11th. Game day or election day is March 3rd. However, that's not the real deadline. Under Minnesota law, the counties, and it's a county-based system, the counties have six weeks to get all that data in, and then they have a four-week grace period. They can ask for an extra four weeks. So it's really 10 weeks after March 3rd, whatever that turns out to be, which is right around the, the time of the adjournment of the legislative session. So there's plenty of time to do it this year, to have an impact this year on this contest so Minnesotans can go in and have some assurance that by signing on the dotted line and affiliating in this way with a political party, um, that it's not going to leak out there and downstream it won't sort of um, get out. I, I think that's, a, that's very, very important for our democracy and very, very important for the validity of this particular contest. So it's an exciting thing in many ways, and I don't want to be all doom and gloom here. I think the move to a primary was a good idea. I think it was a good idea. And the reason is, look, I'm the product, politically, of the, the caucus system. I value it. I think there's so much about it that is good and healthy um, and decent and makes our politics um, vibrant and um, uh, I think um, special in a lot of ways. Um, but one clear disadvantage of the caucus process is there's no absentee provision at all. As many of you know, sounds like most of you know in this room, um, must be present to win, as they always say, on all the sweepstakes and the other things. Um, if you're sick that night, if your kid's sick, if you're working the night shift, if you're in the military, if you're an exchange student in London, that's it, you're out. There's no way to participate. You can't. Um, and so, and that's a problem. Not everyone has the luxury to give two or three hours on a snowy night or a cold night in Minnesota in February or March. So the idea of a primary is to swing the doors wide open to every eligible voter, not just those who, for whom it's easy for their schedule to show up at the community center or the church or the junior high or whatever, but to everyone. And I support that. But these data rules uh, are of real concern to me. And more importantly than me, I think will be and, and, and are currently a concern to a lot of Minnesotans. So I don't think we need a backdoor party registration system. I think instead we want a system that assures that people will um, vote with comfort that by weighing in on the nominee for their chosen political party, they're not risking some adverse reaction in their workplace or in their neighborhood or anywhere else. So it's an exciting time, an exciting year, an intense year. As I said at the beginning, buckle up. The next nine and a half months are going to be very interesting. And again, I come back to that word, very, very intense. But we got a good thing going in Minnesota. And as to this presidential nominating primary, PNP, things are going to turn out just fine. There's some tweaks. There's some changes I'd, I'd like to see made. But this is a fun and interesting and noble experiment. And so um, uh, thank you for your time and for your attention. I want to hear from you now. I want to hear not just your questions, but if you have answers, pushback, feedback, like I said. Give me anything you got on this or any other election issue that you care to talk about. Thank you very much. Do you want to use mine? Great question. So that was the subject of a recent lawsuit. Uh, we were sued. We're sued a lot, by the way. Um, so the legislature wrote the law in 2016 saying that instead of a filing period, which is what we typically do for all of our offices, hey, it's like a, you know, 
a job posting almost. Hey, such and such office is open. Here's a filing period for a week and a half or so. Go file and pay a fee if you want to run for this office. For this contest, um, the legislature said, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to have the chairs of the political parties give us the list of candidates who's out. There's no filing fee. There's no filing process. They just get to pick. And the Republican Party made the choice to only put President Trump on the ballot. That was it. None of the other candidates, and there are a few, uh, former Governor Bill Weld of Massachusetts, uh, former Congressman from Illinois, uh, some others who are running against him for the Republican nomination. But the Republican Party of Minnesota said, no, we're just going to put President Trump on. And there were some people who really um, objected to that. There was a lawsuit. The uh, Supreme Court determined that, you know, not weighing in on the wisdom of the policy, said that it was legal to do that. There's a, very, there's a big difference. They weren't saying it was the right choice. They were saying it was legal for the legislature to do that. It was constitutional for them to do. You know, my own view, and I can say this now that the lawsuit is over, I think a filing period is best. I think it erases doubts about heavy-handed party chairs allegedly, you know, um, knocking out opponents to a uh, particular incumbent. And it could happen in either party. It happened to be the Republican Party this time. But I think it's healthier to have some sort of filing period in there. Um, and a reasonable fee. That's my own view, but that's what the legislature chose in 2016. Thank you. Working on campaigns, we did have information on how people voted in the past. How did the campaign get that information? Well, hard to say. I mean, uh, it could have been survey data. It could have been people who signed some other public pronouncement in favor of a candidate. Uh, pledging that they would vote for them. But I want to make this very clear. The secret ballot in this state and in this country is sacred. Everyone believes that in all 50 states on a bipartisan basis. So there is no way, zero, zero, anywhere in America that I'm aware of for anyone to trace who, you're, who you actually voted for. This contest, this PNP, you'll be able to trace which party's ballot you chose, but nobody, I mean nobody, has any proof of who you actually voted for. So that's an important distinction, I think. Okay, will the presidential primary increase voting in Minnesota? Yeah, I think the jury's still out on that. I mean, I, I will say this. Um, I, I, I take the questioner to mean, will it increase voting downstream? So will a vigorous participation in the primary now pay dividends a few months from now in November? I think it will whet people's appetite, I do. I think there's a bad taste in some people's mouth, including mine, about these data rules. I think that's a serious flaw, but as I said before, the idea of a primary is to swing the doors wide open so that every eligible voter can participate, not just those who happen to be in the good situation of having two or three or four hours to, to spare on a Tuesday night in Minnesota. Um, so I think that part, that enhanced access is good. We'll see how much that is undercut by these data rules. I don't know. If I had to guess, I'd say the uh, attention that Minnesota is going to get. You're not seeing it so much now, but after Iowa and New Hampshire, when March 3rd gets closer and closer, you're going to see candidate visits. You're going to see ads. You're going to see a general feeling of excitement in some quarters. I think net, it's going to probably um, whet the appetite, and uh, it probably won't hurt. Um, you know, in already number one Minnesota, I think there will be intense interest anyway, but I don't think this will hurt it. Tagging on to that, in your opinion, what are three of the biggest barriers to voting in Minnesota? Mm, very interesting. Um, that's a great question. Three of the biggest barriers to voting. Um, let me start with one that is hard to talk about sometimes. You know, uh, nobody loves to talk about laws and legislation more than me. I was in the legislature. I think the laws we put in place and still could put in place um, really have an effect. But let me just dwell on, on something that's hard to legislate, and that is attitudes, states of mind. You, know, you can pass all the laws you want, but in the end, there are people, even in number one Minnesota, and we pat ourselves on the back, no one more than me, uh, in terms of our number one status, and that's great, but that number one status is not evenly distributed. Not every community, either geographic community, demographic community, votes in such high numbers, okay? That's an average. Um, and I think um, we have barriers of the mind. There are a lot of people in the state, hundreds of thousands of people in the state who don't vote, not because it isn't easy to vote, not because they don't understand what the rules are or where they could go or what they could do if they wanted to vote. They don't want to vote. They don't vote because they don't want to vote. And they don't want to vote because there's a disconnect. And the disconnect is they don't see how electing this candidate or that is going to affect their lives, 
They don't see a connection. They don't feel empathy. They don't feel a connection with candidates. They are disillusioned, even disgusted by politics, by the candidates, by politicians, by what they're talking about, what they're not talking about, and all the rest, and that is hard. You can't just pass a bill to get that done. You gotta, you gotta reestablish or establish to begin with that connection. If it were easy, it would have been done a long time ago. I wish I could give you my magic prescription. I don't have one. Other than to try to make politics and campaigns um, more accessible to more people, not just in terms of the rules, but in terms of um, how we talk about elections, how politics is practiced, making it meaningful and making it real to people. Until we do that, we can pass all the laws we want and they'll make some progress and they're ones I could tick off for you that I want us to do. Um, but in the end, you gotta convince people that it's worth participating and it's not their fault and they're not bad citizens or bad people or don't care about their community because they don't vote. It's that they don't see elections as the way to get done what they think is gonna get done. Either they've been burned too many times before or they just do not see the connection between who gets elected to this, that, or the other and their daily lives or the lives of their community, their lives of their family. That's tough. That's really tough. So that's, uh, uh, that occupies enough space to, to be number one, two, and three, I would say, on the list. That's how I'd answer that. Okay. Can you clarify why one should participate in this PNP? And will this help with voter registration for the main presidential election mm. in November? Yeah, to take the second part first, I think it will help with voter registration because unless a person moves between the PNP and the November election, they'll be good to go. They'll be registered already. Um, why should someone vote? Well, if you have a strong opinion about who the nominee of your preferred party should be, now's the time. You know, one of the things, I'm not the first one and I won't be the last one to say, one of the real problems we have sometimes is people don't vote enough in primaries, period. Not just the PNP, but the regular P, <laughs> the, 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 the August primary. Um, so people get to November and they say, well, I don't like the choices. Well, there were earlier opportunities to influence who's on the menu, so to speak. If you don't like what's on the menu, you had an opportunity earlier to shape, to give voice to who should be on that menu. And the presidential nominating primary is, so if you're a strong Republican or you're a strong Democrat and you care uh, about who the nominee of your party is, this is the chance. Rather than wait for other people to do it and risk being upset or disappointed at who or what is on the menu in the November general election. The question is, if the candidate that was the in the Minnesota primary doesn't make it as a nominee on the first ballot at national convention, what happens? So my understanding of both party rules is that if there's no nominee um, after the first ballot in either major party, then everyone's a free agent. You might be committed to candidate X. If there is no nominee on the first ballot, that's it. You start over. No, everybody's released from their pledges. Now that hasn't happened in the United States of America since, again, 1956. 1956 was the last time that either party, it happened to be the Democrats that year, Adlai Stevenson was renominated for president. He had run in 1952. He ended up being the nominee, but 1956 was the last time that either political party failed to nominate someone on the first ballot. So historically, it isn't common, at least in the last 64 years, but that is my understanding according to the party rules of what would happen. Okay. If a person signs the roster but then declines to choose a party mm -hmm. to obtain a ballot, will the person's name be dropped from the list of registered voters? No, no, the person's list won't be dropped, the person's name won't be dropped from the list. You'll always be on the roster as a registered voter, I wanna stress that. But the person won't be allowed to vote in that contest. You must declare um, an allegiance, so to speak, you must sign that oath, uh, you must declare which party's ballot you wanna get, and if you don't wanna do that, if a voter doesn't wanna do that, um, that's perfectly understandable, acceptable, but that's the condition for voting in this contest. That's it, that's the way the legislature wrote the law. Who are the sponsors of the idea to share voter PNP data with all parties? <laughs> How hard of a fight at the legislature do you anticipate it will be to put parameters on use of data. Yeah. I think it will be a fight um, to the second part of the question and it'll be a fight because of um, how we got in the situation. So, um, you know, I wasn't in the room. 
Um, but uh, apparently, uh, this idea of spreading it to four different political parties, which is nowhere required in the national party rules. Remember I told you how they weighed in and said, you got to do it this way or we're not recognizing. They never asked for, nor do their rules require, that they get everybody's data. The de Democrats just said, our party rules say we got to get the Democratic list, and the Republicans said the same about their list. But they never argued. They never asked for this. They never asked that, well, Republicans never said, no, 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 we need their list too. They never said that. The way that came about at the end of last session is my understanding is that the chair of the Senate Elections Committee uh, insisted on that in closed door negotiations at the end of the session. Um, she remains the chair of the Elections Committee and um, I don't see her revisiting her decision, her apparent decision to um, put this data in the hands of four different political party organizations. And I don't know, she has not committed um, one way or another on our proposed legislation. Um, so I think it's important that um, uh, people make themselves heard and felt on this issue if they feel strongly enough about it. On that note, again, yep. who do citizens contact to change legislation regarding giving names to political parties when casting a ballot? When should they do this? Yeah. When they should do it is ASAP, like now. The legislature comes back into, seven, uh, into session on February 11th. It's important that by the time they get there on February 11th, they have heard from Minnesotans about what they value in terms of this, this data. So if you agree with me that um, there should be downstream serious limitations and restrictions on what the parties can do with this data, it's important to contact not only your legislator, but also the chairs of the elections committees in the House and the Senate. In the Minnesota House, that chair is Ray Dean, D-E-H-N, pronounced Dean, of Minneapolis. In the Senate, uh, the chair is Mary Kiffmeyer. Senator Mary Kiffmeyer. Okay. Do you think ranked choice voting for state office is a good idea? Why or why not? So I have been a supporter, since the time I was in the legislature, of expanding options for ranked choice voting. Um, it's a noble experiment. Many of you know there are three communities in Minnesota right now that have it, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park, which I used to represent in the legislature. Those are the three. Others are poised to adopt it. And so I think there will be a handful or more in the next several years that do it. Uh, it is a noble experiment. I'm fascinated by the, um, the effect that um, uh, ranked choice voting has or may uh, have in future years on turnout, on the tone of political, um, campaigns on the so-called spoiler effect, making sure that people can really effectuate um, their views by showing intensity of feeling, not just choosing lesser among evils. That said, um, when it comes to statewide, I I'm reserving judgment about whether we should bring it to the statewide level yet. Um, I think, as I've said before, I think it needs a little more time in the oven. I'd like to see more communities adopt it, more than just Minneapolis, St. Paul, and St. Louis Park. I'd love to see, for example, some more suburban or even rural communities adopt it so we can get a good cross-section of the state. So I'll be watching with great interest as more and more communities adopt it and as more and different kinds of elections in those communities experience it. Okay, we have another one here. Um, spe specific to the PNP, what are the rules now in Minnesota for convicted persons to vote? Served sentence? Done with probation? What about fee payments, community service? Right. Okay, well, I have some strong feelings on this one. Um, just a quick lay of the land here, and some of you are familiar with this, but others might not be. You can divide the states into different sort of baskets or buckets when it comes to how to treat people currently serving a felony sentence, but who are out of prison. So over on this end of the spectrum, you have two states, Maine and Vermont, the only two states in the country where you never lose your right to vote, ever. You could be in prison serving seven consecutive life terms, okay? You're never getting out, but you still have the right to vote, Maine and Vermont. The next batch of states include states like um, North Dakota, our border state, and a growing list of states who say, look, we're going to have a bright line rule. If you're in prison, you can't vote. But the minute you leave prison, the minute someone has determined that you are good enough, safe enough, a worthy enough risk to leave prison, you get your civil rights restored and you get to have that right to vote back. That's where I wish we were and that's where I think and predict that we will head. Um, 
The next group is where Minnesota is now. Minnesota is among the plurality of states that says, no, you only get your right to vote back once your entire sentence is served, not just the prison part, but the on paper part, as it's called, meaning if you're on supervised release or probation, et cetera. So you don't get the right to vote back until all of that is done. And then finally, on this end of the spectrum, you have some states, a few, many in the Deep South, where you either actually or practically speaking never get the right to vote back. Um, so there is a movement in Minnesota with strong bipartisan support to move us from our current category to the North Dakota category, let's call it. And I think it is the right thing to do. It's a civil rights and a human rights issue. If you have left prison behind, if someone has determined that you are worthy enough to rejoin the rest of us in society, you're putting your life back together, you are trying to get a job, you are getting a job, you are a tax-paying citizen, you're contributing to society, then you should have a say in who governs you and how. I think it's that simple for me. And so um, I hope we move in that direction, and I think we are. There is broad bipartisan support for it. It's not quite yet there because of some political dynamics. I predict and I hope that we will get there in the next few years. Okay, thank you. A recent news report said that software in the ballot marking, marking devices could be hacked does the OSS or local election offices check the security and accuracy of the auto marking software? Yes, that's an issue that's come up quite a bit. So in Minnesota, we have rigorous protections when it comes to election security on the equipment itself. So there's two levels of screening. First, we will only even look at certifying anything in Minnesota. We, it's not even on the list eligible for us to certify unless it has first been certified by a federal uh, government agency called the Election Assistance Commission with a lab that is designated by them in Washington, D.C. And if it passes that, that only makes them eligible for us to do the same kind of screening here. Then we do, I've seen it, we do it regularly, it's open to the public, anyone can come and watch. We subject these machines to rigorous testing, we try to trick the machines basically, we look at all sorts of security features, then and only then will we certify them. But what about the individual machines? That's just certifying a brand or a product. In Minnesota, we have what's called public accuracy testing. It's little known, not many people attend, although it is public, anyone can attend, before every election contest, PNP, regular primary, um, the November general election. It is open season. Elections administrators must, this is not optional, must put all the machines through the paces, including the ballot marking machines that you're describing, um, the, the auto marks and the others for that are typically for voters with disabilities. So we do that in Minnesota, and I think that's a good thing. It's a level of sort of security and screening that other states do not enjoy. So I feel very good about where we are. And tagging on to that again, is there any movement in the Minnesota legislature for going to only postal voting like Colorado wow. and very Oregon? interesting. Yeah, I'll tell you what. So there are three states in the country Oregon, Washington, and Colorado with an asterisk, mostly Colorado, um, where they vote only by mail. That's it. There are no polling places. Every registered voter gets a ballot mailed to them, and that's it. No election judges, no polling places, with a few exceptions. Um, and they've really enjoyed that system. Um, Oregon was the first, then Washington, and then more recently in the last three or four years, Colorado. I would say this for Minnesota. My view is, no, I don't think there's an appetite to go completely postal here. Um, wait, that didn't sound right, did it? When I say go postal, I meant it in the election sense, not in the other sense. Um, so uh, the, the way I, I would put it is this. I think people really like our hybrid system. So if everyone in Minnesota chose to vote absentee by mail, we would in effect become Oregon and Washington. But it's a choice. It isn't one size fits all. So we have this great system now where you can go to mnvotes.org, that's our website, and you can order the ballot to come to you as part of No Excuses Absentee Voting. You don't have to go to a government building anymore. You can go to mnvotes.org, have the ballot come to you, and you can vote over days or weeks. You can vote one contest while you're eating breakfast, put it down for a day or a week, pick it up again when you're folding laundry, put it down for a day or a week, pick it up again when you're watching a ball game or TV or whatever. You get the idea, and people really have flocked to this because not only do they like the convenience of getting it home, they like to being able to 
research the candidates on their own time. Most people have a strong view on President of the United States, for example, but they not, might not know enough about the county commissioner's race or something like that, so they like to do that. So we already have that option, a growing option. As I mentioned earlier, we have 24% in Minnesota now voting absentee. And so, in effect, we have the option, uh, which many are taking advantage of, of voting by mail, in essence, but we're not saying it's the only option. I kind of like that. So. I, I'm not at the point where I think we should adopt the Oregon and Washington style regime where the only way you can vote is to vote by mail. And frankly, I'm a traditionalist in that way. I like game day. I like walking into the polling place. I like saying hi to the election judges. I like the vibe and the feel and the energy behind it. That's just me. Um, so I'm not ready to say that we should do all and only mail. So how have many Minnesota voters been removed from voter list? Uh, and what would be the reason that they would be removed from yeah. voter list? Great question. You hear a lot lately about voter purges in some other states. States that, in my judgment, and not just my judgment, other people's judgment as well, have gone way too far, have, have been way too draconian about how they purge and remove people from voting lists. So there is a federal requirement for almost all states to do what they call list maintenance. How's that for a technical term? And for all the reasons that you might expect, um, you wanna make sure you're going through and making sure there aren't deceased people on the rolls. Th th there's a role to play for going through and screening and filtering people who shouldn't be on the list. But there's some states, let me pick on Georgia here for a minute, that have gone way, way too far. They have interpreted the federal law, they have interpreted the federal law to um, empower them to do something they call an exact match system, okay? Exact match. This caused about 50,000 people within the space of just a couple months in uh, 2018 during a very contentious and ultimately very close gubernatorial election there to be wiped from the polls. And it meant even if an apostrophe was off, if someone named O'Malley didn't have the apostrophe after the, the, uh, the O, or if someone accidentally uh, still had a maiden name, or a new name, or it was Robert instead of Bob, or something like that. They were kicked off the voter rolls. And what makes it even worse and more draconian and outrageous in a state like Georgia is they don't have same-day voter registration, okay? Now, if something like that happened in Minnesota, and by the way, I'll get to the question. Spoiler alert, we don't do that in Minnesota. But if something like that happened in Minnesota, if any one of you, either here today or in the viewing audience, found yourself, show up at your polling place, and you've been purged, you've been kicked off the list, you're not on the list, you're not on the roster, the election judge says, I'm sorry, sir, I'm sorry, ma'am, you're not here, you're not on the list, you'd be puzzled, you'd probably be mad and frustrated, you'd roll your eyes, you'd raise a fuss, but in the end, if they persisted, you'd say, all right, fine, give me the form, I'll just re-register right here. You're wrong and I'm right, but I'll humor you. I'll re-register right here and you'd be fine. That's the remedy. There is no such remedy like that in Georgia, okay? So if you're kicked off the list, and if you don't know you're kicked off the list, sure, they send you a postcard. What if that gets lost in the pizza coupons or the oil change coupons, right? You never see that, you never know. And you show up on election day and you're not on the list because you're O'Malley and someone left off the apostrophe, you have no remedy. You realistically have no remedy. And that's what makes it frightening, and that's what makes it way, way out of bounds. Unfortunately, cor courts have sided with the state of Georgia and said that their interpretation of the federal law is A-OK. -okay. I think that's awful, just awful. And no, we don't do that in Minnesota. We don't purge at all. The worst that could happen to you is that you end up on inactive status, we call it. But that's not purging. You're still on the list. It just means that you got to either re-register before Election Day or you can just show up like you always do um, on Election Day. That's it. Can you share with us some initiatives that are coming out of your office mm -hmm. to encourage youth and other underrepresented uh, persons to vote? Absolutely. Many. So uh, Michael Wall here from our office uh, uh, um, is the, the really mastermind of, of youth in particular. As I mentioned, he's the one who helped us get off the ground the uh, uh, students vote uh, program in high schools, which is the first ever mock election. We are going to be, I can announce this, right? Yeah. We are going to be joining forces and merging forces and efforts with YMCA's Youth in Government program this year to expand our reach uh, to a lot more places around the state. Uh, so we're really excited about that. 
we're also um, uh, tinkering with our college outreach program as well. So typically, the last two election cycles, it's been we called it Minnesota Ballot Bowl. And it was a competition among college campuses to register as many students as they could. We're switching to a new model. I'm authorized to announce this too, right? Um, we are switching to a new model, and this is exciting, where the competition, we'll still have a competition among two-year, four-year, public, private, you name it, across Minnesota, but this time the metric will not be registration, it will be actual voting. So in partnership with Tufts University uh, in uh, suburban Boston, happens to be my alma, alma mater, um, we, um, we are doing that based on voting itself, not just registration. You can lead a horse to water, right, as the old saying goes. So you can register people, but we want to see evidence, and now we can track it in a really uh, tangible way that you didn't just register to vote. That's great. That's an opening gambit. But we want to make sure that you also vote as well. So that's exciting. Uh, in terms of others, you know, one of the things that I'm proudest of that we've done in the last couple of years, um, and it's personal for me, uh, we have doubled the number of languages that we serve, more than doubled, um, uh, both in writing and online, from five to 11. And thank you. It's personal for me because I am the son of an immigrant. My mother was from Austria. And, um, and I know how that goes. I know how that goes. And once in a while, I will get pushback from folks. And the pushback usually sounds something like this. They'll say, Steve, I don't get it. Why are we printing anything election related in a language other than English? After all, you can only be you can only vote if you're a citizen, and you can only become a citizen in almost all cases if you pass some sort of English proficiency test. So by definition, shouldn't everyone who's eligible to vote understand English well enough not to need it in another language? Seems to make logical sense, and I get that a fair amount. I have two responses to that. One is the real world gut response I have from having grown up under the roof in a bilingual house with an immigrant mother. And I'm here to tell you, and some of you have experienced this yourself, I know how it works in the real world, okay? And in the real world, um, people like my mom who spoke beautiful, fluent, almost accent-free English, she sounded nothing like her fellow countryman, Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? <laughs> he has a thick, heavy accent. The guy's been here for 50 years. Um, they came within a year of each other, actually. Um, but she didn't sound like him at all. But I know from her experience that when it came to technical instructions, okay, not conversational English, technical instructions, I don't care whether it was the refrigerator manual or a government document, she wanted that stuff, that technical stuff, in her native language, and any of us would. That's just how it is. I can't make it more simpler than that, more simple than that. That is just how it is. Second response is this. Minnesota has been doing this, meaning printing election materials in languages other than English, since 1896. Not 1996, 1896. And I should have brought with me today, I didn't, but I have in my office from the Historical Society the yellowed copies, frayed and yellowed copies of those 1896 and those first few elections. Back then, the languages were Finnish, Norwegian, Swedish, German, French, what they called Bohemian, which we would call Czech today, but they labeled it Bohemian, Polish, others. Now, none of those languages is on the list. Now the languages are Spanish and Somali and Hmong and so forth. So the only principled difference between what we started doing 124 years ago and what we're doing now, the only principled difference is the languages. That's it. So some of us, I include myself in this category, were exposed growing up to this mythology of, well, why are we bending over backwards for this wave of immigrants? I mean, when my grandparents or great-grandparents came here, boy, if they didn't learn English and real quick, they were really in big trouble. Look, I can't speak to any other state with any authority, and I can't even speak in Minnesota about most other areas. But I can tell you in Minnesota when it came to elections, that mythology is provably wrong. Provably wrong. 1896, remember that. We were printing stuff in other languages. So this isn't bending over backwards for anyone more than we've been doing for 124 years. What are some of the largest voter turnout regions in the state? Ah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, in 2018, uh, Hennepin County was on fire. <laughs> Hennepin County, people were pretty fired up to vote in Hennepin County. Um, Carver County, uh, on the edge of the metro area, is typically one, two, or three. They do really well when it comes to voting. St. Louis County, 
um, which is Duluth and the Iron Range. It's our largest county by land mass in Minnesota. They also vote in, in great numbers. So those are three of the pockets, I would say, and I expect that to continue, at least for now, but those are places, at least geographically speaking, where people vote in droves, very, very high numbers. Least, um, you know, that too is sort of spread out. I, I don't know how much I want to name or shame uh, particular <laughs> counties, except to say that um, there's some counties around the state that, that, that I think have some work to do. Um, some in western Minnesota, a couple I'm thinking about in southern Minnesota, one in north central Minnesota, where almost inexplicably there's sort of a drop in these counties. And hard to say for sure why, but I think they've got work to do. If you early vote and later change your mind, can you change your ballot? Yes. I love that question. Uh, I get that question a lot. Yes. In Minnesota, we have a rule that, so we have a 46-day absentee period. It started last Friday. Up until day minus four, excuse me, up until day minus seven. Day minus seven. That goes for the PNP, the August primary, a special election, the municipal, any election in Minnesota. Up until day minus seven, you can claw back your ballot. You can fish it out of the pile. Why? Because day minus seven is the first day on which all election authorities are able to open those envelopes. From day minus 46 to day minus seven, they sit in a pile, unopened. Can't even open them. Can't even take them out of the envelope and put them in a pile. Only on day minus seven can they start opening the absentee ballots. And of course, once they do that, they're all commingled and you can't fish it out. So if you vote tomorrow in the PNP and your candidate drops out of the race, isn't even on the ballot on March 3rd, well, it's on the ballot, but isn't even in the race on March 3rd, um, you can fish that sucker right out of the pile and ask for a new ballot. And a lot of people don't know that. We always try to spread the word every election cycle and every election about that, so don't worry about that. If a candidate drops out, and that's particularly an issue in this contest, people don't normally drop out in November elections, right? But in a presidential nominating primary, people drop out of the race. So if a candidate drops out, or if in a later contest in November, say, you watch a debate, or there's a scandal, or an ad that you see that's compelling, or whatever it is, remember, day minus seven, you can go to your city or county, and you can say, please give me my absentee ballot back. Please destroy it and give me another one, and you will get it. You can fish it out. So you are not writing anything in blood right now if you vote. On day minus six, five, four, three, two, and one, you are locked in. Where do you see technology, excuse me, where do you see technology taking the voting process? Are we able to, going to be able to vote on our cell phones? Very interesting. I get that one a lot too. Do you think we'll ever be able to vote online or vote electronically? You know, depends what you mean about ever. Um, do I see it in the foreseeable, f foreseeable future? No. I, I don't see any technology right now that would make it secure. Um, so the answer in the foreseeable future is no. But then again, look, you know, um, 12 years ago, we didn't know what an iPhone was, right? The first smartphone came out in 2007. So who knows what technology that neither we nor anyone we know has dreamt up yet that will surface that will make all our current concerns about security seem quaint and outdated, right? We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. So I wouldn't say never, but right now, based on what's in front of us and what we know out there, I don't see a safe way to make true online voting um, something that we'll do. Interesting on technology, if I could just take a step back since the general question was technology. You know, once in a while, low tech is better than high tech. And let me give you an example. Though this wasn't the question, I will slightly hijack the question. Um, so election security. I could go on and do a whole hour just on that topic, because it really is sort of job number one in our office for the last few years. Um, but one thing that puts Minnesota in a really good position compared to other states, and just generally, is that we are a paper ballot state in Minnesota, okay? Yes. So there were a good 15 or more states that, oh, a decade, decade and a half ago, decided that they would buy into this notion of the future and buy touchscreen voting machines with no receipt and no paper trail. You expect better from an ATM machine when you go get cash, right? You expect it to spit out something. But there are states that went in for that. We never did. 
there has always been a bipartisan, rock-solid consensus for good old-fashioned paper. Are there electronic components? Of course, you know that from your own experience. You feed it into a tabulator and the rest. But at the end of the day, if you or anyone else has a bad vibe or a bad feeling or gets a tip about you know, some breach or fraud or anything else, we've got those ballots and we've got to keep them for almost two years under federal law in warehouses and you, know, you name it. And we keep those ballots. And you can touch them and feel them and see them. And it's one of those, you know, relatively few examples of low tech beating high tech, no question about it. So speaking of technology, it's not always the latest, greatest cutting edge thing. Sometimes good old fashioned paper. How is the order of candidates on the ballot determined? And you have a sample ballot on the back of your program. Hmm? So would you like to look at that? <laughs> well, I know, I know the answer. Uh, Generally speaking, so when it comes to in a general election with political parties, and, and there's also, I gotta be, well, so there's some pending litigation on that as well. Um, the rule in Minnesota, interestingly, and not a lot of people know this, is um, you take all the major parties, the major parties, and there are rules for who is a major party. Right now we have four, DFL, Republican, um, and then the two marijuana parties, and um, Basically, you, you go in um, reverse order of their success in the last election. So the party that did the best will be fourth. So there's litigation right now, I don't mind telling you, where um, the DFL party has sued because they did the best in 2018, but they're gonna be fourth on the ballot across Minnesota and for all offices. They're gonna be fourth, assuming there are four candidates. And then the non-major parties will be below that. But, and so basically they're saying, look, uh, their argument, they have a legal argument too, but under, under it all is this idea of, hey, we're, we're being punished by, for our own success, is what they would say. So probably shouldn't say more, it's pending litigation, but that's how it's determined in Minnesota. Some people think uh, as a policy matter that we should just do some sort of rotation you know, a random rotation by county or by some other jurisdictional line. I, think, I happen to think that makes some sense. If the state is paying for the PNP, why do the political parties get to choose who is on the ballot? I think that, I think that was asked already. Did I ask that question? Yep. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> um, how did you get interested in this job? Ah, yeah, well. So I was in the legislature for 10 years. And it always seemed to me when I was in the legislature that all roads really led to the ballot box. They really did. No matter what issue you care about the most, whether it's environmental protection or civil rights or jobs or roads or schools or healthcare or whatever, you're not gonna get very far until and unless you get people elected to public office who share your views and values. There are other ways to make change, but ultimately so much of this is about who gets elected to stuff. The stuff could be the legislature, it could be city council, it could be president of the United States, it could be school board or whatever. Um, and so, so much is tied to the outcome of elections. And then there's a more personal part that goes beyond just me and the legislature and all that. Um, so on the other side of my family, my father's side, my great grandparents came to this country from Eastern Europe. And I like to say they didn't just immigrate, they fled. They fled, they fled Eastern Europe and a totally hostile uh, atmosphere for them. They couldn't worship as they pleased. Um, they faced harassment, they faced threats, they faced violence. And so they came to this country. Um, and one of the things they didn't have when they were there is they didn't have a say in who governed them or how. And they came to this country, they came to Minnesota and they got those things, including a right to vote that they never had before. And I don't take that for granted and never have. And so that's something precious for all of us. All of you know this, those who particularly who are involved in the League of Women Voters, that's why you're here. That's why you're involved the way you are. And all roads lead to the ballot box. So it's an everyone issue, no matter what. Thank you very much. That was our last question. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amy. Thank you. I just wanna say, thank Secretary Simon for speaking for us tonight. Let's give him another round of applause. So again, we'd like to 
thank SPNN for hosting us tonight. And a big thank you to the League of Women Voters of Minneapolis uh, for helping put tonight's program together. And um, before you go, I have a couple of directives from uh, the organizers. Please take cookies with you when you leave. <laughs> I've tested them already, they're really good. Um, and then remember, March 3rd is the um, Minnesota presidential nominating primary, so mark your calendars, go vote. And um, don't forget about the survey. Let us know what you thought about the program. Let us know what you'd like us to do um, in uh, upcoming programs. We do have another election program uh, related uh, topic coming up February 18th, uh, elections and cybersecurity. And that is going to be at the Summit Brewing Tap Room. So mark your calendars and join us again for that. Thanks for coming. <laughs>